Okay, thank you. So halfway between Arctic and Antarctica. Uh, and uh, before I, I start talking about free time, uh, just uh, the last time I was standing up here, I, I was uh, trying to express the opinion that not everyone will want to drive uh, or, or to be driven by automatic cars. Uh, but I, I don't think that my small, single, humble opinion is going to make a big dent into uh, David Humphrey's uh, uh, equation for uh, the demand of, of minerals in terms of the, uh, the intensity of use. Uh, but besides that, uh, it's clear that uh, surface exposure, surface open pit mines are disappearing. Uh, they will be replaced by small artisanal operations, um, predictably in Africa, as we see politically at the moment. And um, so what I'm going to try to build up here uh, is a, a, a potential uh, uh, prospect which could be one-third the size of the Bushveld complex. And, of course, that's a very risky thing to say. It's just an opinion. But we, we, will, we will look at this uh, from a number of perspectives. So, first of all, I'm going to give you a very brief geological introduction to the area. Uh, and then we will look at uh, some of the, the research on the mineralization onshore in free time. Uh, and then we will go to the, the seismic and potential fields correlations uh, to see what that can tell us and then some conclusions and, and potentially some future direction. Uh, how do we need technology to evolve uh, to start mining effectively offshore? And we already have some of those answers uh, provided today. So uh, the, the Freetown Laodignus complex, onshore in Freetown, I'm going to call it Flick for short, otherwise I'll be taking up too much time saying Freetown Laodignus complex. Uh, it has, was uh, originally, according to Barry et al., in place as early as Middle Triassic times, maybe even older than 230 million years ago. And uh, it occupies a, a position uh, to the, the southeast of the Guinea Marginal Plateau uh, here, and uh, it straddles the Guinea Fracture Zone. Uh, it may even be, have been responsible for the development of the Guinea Fracture Zone, um, preventing the propagation of any displacement uh, along a, a major fault that was trying to potentially propagate uh, along the fracture zone. Um, and, of course, north in the Guinea Marginal Plateau, we have uh, Central Atlantic Oceanic Spreading, Jurassic Rifting, and south of the, the Guinea Fracture Zone, uh, we have the later onset of Equatorial Atlantic Oceanic Spreading and accompanying rifting. Um, and uh, uh, the, 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 these are some extracts from a report that was produced of the petroleum exploration industry, funnily enough. And here I am uh, trying to talk it up uh, in terms of uh, uh, maybe uh, one of these significant uh, uh, offshore prospects which will inevitably perhaps potentially be developed one day once we have all of the technology in place. Um, so the... the the, 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 this is the, uh, the onshore exposure. It's uh, 65 kilometers long, 14 kilometers wide, 7 kilometer thick, foliatic intrusion as described by Barry. Uh, it's uh, a complex that has four rhythmically layered uh, sequences of uh, a variety of minerals. Um, but crucially, thanks to uh, a good geochemist based down in Cape Town, um, the PGM here is associated with magnetite and not chromite as in the Bushveld complex. So as he, as he said, uh, this isn't the Bush, Bushveld complex yet. Um, and if we look at some of the extensive research that uh, Bowles et al. have produced over the years, uh, it appears that, um, uh, that the, the initial work was uh, conducted on uh, the, the analysis of assay concentrations in the lateritic horizons, the weather profile section of this large mafic intrusive feature. Um, and uh, what, we, what, what has been discovered crucially is that uh, the, the, the highest concentrations of assay highlighted here in yellow, around about 300 parts per billion, that's about 0 0.3 grams per tonne, sub-economic grade. Uh, th this is what has been found onshore. Um, but we don't know uh, where, where these grains, these high concentration grains have come from. Uh, it was concluded that the 
the, 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 these concentrations were developed through secondary mobilization of the original PGM grains and then recrystallization into larger grains. So I'm sure not so promising, uh, but perhaps maybe uh, in an era where uh, you can drill one kilometer uh, of borehole, shallow borehole, uh, boreholes um, through lateritic weathered section, uh, 50, say 50 meters thick per day, um, that may be the first step to take. Uh, take it deeper, see and extract uh, uh, to do your multi-element analysis to see what else you can get out from the, the onshore outcrop. Uh, if we look regionally, there, there are other examples of Mesozoic uh, mafic uh, exposures around the areas. We head north into Guinea. Uh, first stop is um, the, the Conakry uh, uh, mafic cumulates and uh, the, the bedrock there is uh, dunite um, or and, and, and then the, the lacolithic uh, uh, cacolima uh, uh, cumulates which, uh, which it, it exists to the northeast of, of the uh, conakry trend and we have uh, mafic coastal and lateritic mineralization uh, platinum nickel uh, further north into Cap Verga, uh, we have a bauxite mine which has been opened up recently on the peninsula. And again, uh, mafic dikes. All of this is regionally related to the original Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, uh, which uh, is a great hot topic, not necessarily so in, in the petroleum industry, but uh, from the point of view of what we are starting to build up here, it uh, obviously has quite... Uh, some significance, especially when we look at the potential fields data. We can see how all of these exposures relate to uh, some very large intrusive feature, uh, which uh, seems to consist of maybe one or two lobes. Um, and then this is a, a picture of the Moho. We have a, an axis here, which uh, may be the original Comdui or feeder, uh, which uh, ignited this, uh, this emplacement uh, uh, in this setting. And in the magnetics, we have uh, a string of dipolar anomalies on the same strike trend north-northwest um, uh, as uh, the, the residual gravity in the MOHO re reflection of the, of the cross-mantle boundary. Uh, and, the, and we get these uh, very strongly remnantly magnetized uh, uh, dipolar anomalies commonly associated with mafic and ultramafic intrusive bodies. Uh, now this is a fun slide because we have 60,000 square kilometres of the Bushveld complex and we know that all of the platinum mineralisation is in the west and the east lobes. And here we have uh, the flick and there could be maybe one or two lobes there. And who knows, if we look at the complementary structure in South America, offshore, Suriname, French Guyana, uh, there may be some remnants, I haven't looked over there yet, there may be some remnant fragments of similar lobes, so it might have been split into two, who knows. Uh, obviously, the Bushveld complex is a lot older uh, than uh, the, the, the flick, and uh, it... Uh, is obviously three times the size um, and is associated with uh, chromite uh, and not magnetite. If we go back to the 1952 seismic fraction survey acquired by the Lamont Doherty Ge Geological Survey, reinterpreted by Sheridan in 1969, uh, we see a very good correlation with uh, a faulted margin here. They interpreted a Cambrian Devonian section of metamorphosed sediment underneath uh, the Cretaceous rift sequence. Um, and they noted anomalously high seismic refraction velocities for that interval. And maybe they nearly got it right. And it is actually flick. It's actually uh, th this interval here is a, a, a layered igneous complex, uh, which has been intruded through the Precambrian basement, which will uh, underlie it. If we look at the MOHO, we can see that when we get to leg 28, uh, in 1952, they had their 
cross mantle for the oceanic portion of the crust at 12 kilometers. And that's quite a nice fit uh, in over 60 years. So it's nice to be able to make correlations uh, with, with uh, original observations like that. Um, and th this fault in here is where we have very deep crust. So this is all extended continental crust. Now we're going to showcase some of the, the seismic data kindly um, provided by TGS. And uh, in all of the, the four seismic sections that I'm going to show you here, they basically have uh, three seismic fasces, the post acting basin sequence following the rift and drift of the, the equatorial Atlantic Oceanic spreading. Then this very uh, faint stratification, which uh, I think is the, the mafic layered intrusive complex. And then underneath that, uh, we get some semblance of discordant, higher amplitude uh, reflectors, which I think is the Precambrian metamorphosed basin. And we can see how these faults here uh, correlate with what we have on the residual gravity. And th th this is sort of almost a, a very acute strike line, uh, cutting acutely the, the, the strike axis of the, the flick to, towards the north-northwest. Uh, we go into the next one again, post-Aptian concordant reflectors uh, this layering with faint internal stratification. Uh, the layered, uh, layered complexes, we know that we can get uh, stratification on meter to hundreds of meters scale. So it's not surprising that we, that we are seeing this. And let's not forget that no special effort has been made by TGS to process this data to enhance um, <laughs> The, the, the seismic fasces contained within the intrusive body. Because after all, how many, I know that there are some mining companies out there using seismic data, uh, shallow seismic data, uh, for, the, for the purpose of, of exploration. But this is another avenue. That this, is, this is saying, OK, so we have it. And look how uh, it shallows as we go towards the coast. And we're, we're going towards the, the, the Conakry uh, complex. And so it's not really that deep. Uh, potentially, you could drill through that. And of course, let's not forget that uh, for all that time up to the Cretaceous period, this uh, camp in place, igneous intrusive, is going to have been subjected to sub aerial erosion. There's going to have been the development of, uh, uh, of channels, channel cuts, and, and uh, deposition runoff into the margins. So there may be pools of, of, uh, of paleo-weathered material akin to the modern-day lateritic horizons that we have on shore. Uh, line six, uh, so we're heading towards the south. And uh, again, we, we can make correlations with the ridge, potentially a feeder zone uh, where we have Precambrian Basin. It's reflected. Uh, in the gravity signature where we're coming off uh, this, this very red uh, gravity peak which resembles the, the, the high density contrast between the mafic intrusive and the less dense Precambrian Basin. Uh, th th this mafic, ultra mafic uh, intrusion is incredibly dense. So we can expect there to be uh, a negative density contrast with the Precambrian Basin. And we see that very clearly on this line here, where we also have the seismic refraction profile displayed. And where we have this tilted Precambrian block, it's annotated two and three, uh, we have a trough where the, the tilted block, and, and you can imagine that there is a conduit coming up through here uh, and feeding uh, th this whole system that has cooled very slowly over time, which is why Barry et al. in 2010 got very young... Uh, initial dates for the, the age of the intrusion because it cooled very slowly. But using other dating methods, they found that, hey, actually it could be as old as the middle of the Triassic. Okay, some of the conclusions. Uh, naturally, airborne gravity magnetics is going to provide uh, a lot better definition of the, the structure of the lobes. Um, that, that's fairly straightforward, will cost money. Uh, with the existing seismic 
uh, why not try to reprocess it? When you put it into a depth migrated section with a, a decent velocity uh, model, which honors the fact that you have high velocity, uh, crystalline, uh, intruded, mafic material uh, in parts of that section, um, as we have mapped, we might get a lot better picture uh, to work with. And, but first of all, the geochemistry is so important. Uh, I thought we had a problem with doing 50 by 50. What, how can we do what we do onshore, offshore, but costs effectively? And uh, Tomoko today maybe gave us a solution with the LIBS system because it's ICP uh, uh, OES effectively, and we can uh, couple that with MS and with Keith Kenyon's suggestion using a four acid digestion uh, for multi element analysis, which is going to give us a 48 element multi element analysis to try to build an orientation study as to taking it forward um, and, and making this more real and reducing the risk. And uh, even if the petroleum prospectivity offshore Sierra Leone, uh, as proved by the recent fatal A1, Fatala 1, well, uh, it, there were some oil shows that we, we still have this mineral prospect potentially. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Andrew. That's very interesting to ask. Suggests if there is any question, maybe later for the social or right, a quick question from Catherine. Um, I, we should probably talk about data, but I happen to know the geology of Sierra Leone very well. And the image in your abstract shows very clearly a gravity anomaly east of Freetown, which is something called the Castella Group, which is diuretic to gibberite rocks within the Precambrian basement. Why is the offshore anomaly not just uh, a fault boundary block of the Precambrian basement of that composition? Uh, okay, well, that, that's a very good question. Uh, a very good geological question. Uh, the, the, what, what I think the, the flick is offshore, um, it's the connections that, it, that it's making with what you have as onshore exposures. And when you go and look uh, more locally at the connection between what the structure is doing, uh, what the Moho relief is doing, we've mapped volcanics to the west of, of that offshore flick. And again, we're seeing uh, Moho uplift gravity MOHO uplift, and uh, all of the work that I have done with my MOHO modeling, which uh, I guess is proprietary work, uh, but uh, where you get the, the uplift in the MOHO, it's indicative of uh, some form of extrusive flow or, or, or of magmatic material. So there can't be any doubt that there was extrusion of magmatic material offshore there. Uh, when you go onshore and to the east of the the Freetown layered igneous complex, you're getting into the orogenic belt, yes. the rock leaves and, 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 and so on. And the, so I think the correlations are too clear for me uh, to say that it's what you have as an orogenic belt, because the orogenic belt is a pan African orogenic front. And then in front of that, uh, you have in the Guinea marginal plateau, you have uh, volcanics being. Uh, uh, extruded through the, the, the early Jurassic. We have that in the report, big thick report uh, for the petroleum industry. And so we know, we're pretty confident we have volcanics there. GU2B1, we have volcanics. We know that these things tend to be capped by volcanics. Volcanics I'm happy about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we so we need TGS to enhance the seismic data, I think, as so well. There will be new aeromag the whole country in about a year. Fantastic. Yeah, I'd like to get my hands on that. <laughs>